now we're going to hear about uh, the use of PRP in our practice, um, science versus placebo. We'll start with a very simple, straightforward case of a 40-year-old accountant who's an avid runner. You can see his swollen Achilles. He's failed five months of th therapy, including appropriate heavy load, eccentric stretching and strengthening. He hurts with sports activity. He's miserable. His MRI is consistent with the tendinopathy. And he shows up in your office, and he'd like to have an operation. We'll start with Dr. Kremen. OK. All right, well, uh, thank you to uh, Glenn and the California Orthopedic Association for this opportunity. Um, my name is Tad Kremen. I'm a sports medicine specialist at UCLA. And we're going to talk about PRP. Uh, is it better than placebo? <clears throat> and I'm I'm fairly certain that Glenn picked me for this because he knows that I probably spend more time talking people out of PRP rather than into PRP. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so these are my disclosures. Uh, none of them are really pertinent to this talk. Uh, I have one slide on the science of PRP. Obviously, platelets have a large number of growth factors in them, and we have the ability to concentrate platelets and um, concentrate these growth factors in high concentrations, but this generates kind of a lot of signaling going on and, and how we really engage the desirable growth factors to coordinate healing of these injuries uh, is a real challenge. And how we do this in a variety of different tissue types is, uh, is also a challenge. When you look at Achilles tendinopathy or the case that uh, uh, Dr. Pfeffer has presented here, it seems like a, a good candidate for PRP. It's got poor blood supply. We know that uh, there's a lot of uh, VEGF and uh, endothelial cell growth factors in the PRP potentially. Uh, when you look at the MRI, you can see that there are real changes there, meaning that the extracellular matrix of the tissue is injured, <laughs> some kind of altered local cell biology. So PRP seems perfect, right? Well, let's see what we can learn from uh, case series and sort of the early literature on this topic. We look at a study from 2012 from Dean's, 24 patients, six month follow-up, and everything's perfect. Improved pain, ADLs, quality of life, they go back to sports, but there's really no control group in these studies. Similarly, Gelfi, 2015, three times as many patients, 92% of people satisfied, no real complications, but there's also no control group. When you look at the randomized controlled trial literature on this topic, uh, there's uh, multiple studies uh, that are double blind, randomized, placebo controlled, uh, six month follow up. And really, they just don't see any difference in patient reported outcomes between the saline group and the PRP groups. Uh, and DeVos, uh, who uh, published this in JAMA in 2010, which is pretty rare to see an orthopedic study in JAMA. Uh, showed the same thing, really patient reported outcomes, tendon structure, neovascularization, there's no difference in the saline versus the PRP group. So does a control group even really matter? You know, it sounds great for uh, drug companies testing hypertension medications, but we're, we're talking about musculoskeletal injections. Can a can placebo really have an effect in that setting? Well, there's literature on this too. If you look at the group of Rush, they did a meta-analysis of 13 level one studies, over a thousand patients uh, in NEOA, undergoing a saline injection, placebo um, injection. And they showed that saline alone gave statistically and clinically significant improvement in uh, VAS pain scores in Womack at six months. Something a little more uh, applicable to, to our patient here with the uh, tendonitis. Uh, you look at a meta-analysis of 10 randomized level one and level two studies, 283 patients, saline versus every other kind of injection possible, including things like PRP. And they found that VAS pain scores at six months and 12 months really uh, surpassed all the MCID for normal orthopedic common conditions, i.e. there's there was a real effect of just the saline. Nine out of 10 of these studies showed no significant difference in patient reported outcomes between the saline and the non-saline. So the saline really was just as good as other injections, including PRP. So maybe a meta-analysis can help us with this. Uh, if you look at meta-analyses of uh, uh, randomized controlled trials in Achilles tendinopathy specifically, there's uh, really only 
about four studies that meet the criteria when you try to screen for bias and only include randomized controlled trials, about 170 patients. And again, they really uh, concluded that there's no significant difference between PRP and saline with regard to patient reported outcomes, tendon thickness on ultrasound or Doppler activity. And here's really the reason behind it. This is a, a chart with all the relevant literature on this topic. And if you look in red here, all these studies have no control group. And if you look at the, uh, the one with the apples and oranges, it's really not comparing things that are similar as PRP uh, alone versus PRP in surgery. So if you get rid of all those, you start looking at the studies that really have control groups, there's uh, only about a third of the, all the patients in the literature and five out of six of these studies showed no difference. And then the one study that did show a difference actually showed that you get uh, improvement of, of patient reported outcomes and pain with the high volume corticosteroid, not just PRP. So there's probably still some naysayers out there who would argue that, well, PRP isn't the solution, it's really leukocyte rich PRP. There's obviously a lot of white blood cells that could potentially be in these uh, uh, biologic injections. And um, this paper from LaProd's group really characterized leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor, uh, BMAC, whole blood, or bone marrow aspirate, and showed that leukocyte rich PRP definitely has a lot of uh, PDGF, as well as uh, things like CD40 ligand, which is an inflammatory factor. <clears throat> well, they looked at this too. So when you look at leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor and Achilles tendinopathy, Again, no difference in patient reported outcomes in BAS. Now, this study didn't have a, uh, did not have a placebo control group, but when you look at randomized controlled trials of uh, leukocyte-rich PRP and tendinopathy, again, no difference in patient reported outcome, global uh, rating of change or pain. So really, PRP has a number of known challenges. There's no standardization of manufacturing methods, no dosing standards. Uh, the, the same individual on a different time of day can have a different platelet concentration. So it's, it's hard to really tease these things out. And uh, uh, there's no, also no standardization for administration or return to exercise guidelines. Some people put you in a boot for six weeks with this problem. Some people would, would do nothing. So one way we can make these studies better moving forward is to look at things like uh, the minimum information for studies evaluating biologics and orthopedics and you can see this publication outlines this and others have uh, brought this along further, but there's at least 23 items they'd like you to report as the minimum. So you should probably be reporting even more things. So in conclusion, I think that uh, if you want to ask, is PRP definitively better than placebo? The answer is no. Um, although PRP and other biologics are very exciting and hold a lot of promise, I just don't think there's definitive evidence right now uh, to prove that they're, they're uh, definitively helping our patients. Uh, and just a, a quick note on applications of these things. Uh, there's certainly, um, uh, people, I certainly use this in my practice and, and uh, people ask me, is there really a significant risk associated with PRP? No, I think the downside is relatively low. It's autologous, so there's low risk of disease transmission. The main issue is that it's expensive and it can be painful. So how do you use this in your practice? I think moving forward, if you disclose the risks, your financial relationships, that's sort of the best uh, uh, case scenario currently. You should really follow the literature, paying attention to the well-designed studies, and maybe even consider contributing to literature with uh, this MIBO reporting and really even saving a portion of the sample that you use and following outcomes and coming back and seeing if you can actually attribute those outcomes to a uh, objective finding. Thank you. All right, excellent. Let's now hear from Eric Ferkel at SCOE about his use of PRP in practice. All right. Great job, Tad. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Eric Ferkel, coming to you from Southern California Orthopedic Institute. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, rest of the panel here, and, and especially uh, Dr. Glenn Pfeffer for organizing this great uh, uh, meeting tonight. Um, also to the California Orthopedic Association for putting together this conference. Uh, I was assigned the topic of the role of PRP in foot ankle. Is it a viable option? Now, as Tad recently uh, discussed uh, with a well-done presentation, um, the options for uh, PRP uh, from an evidence standpoint uh, are certainly uh, 
you know, to be to be desired. But let's go back a little bit to what is PRP and why do you think it has a possible role for uh, assistance in uh, managing pain in the tendon or in the ankle joint? So PRP autologous blood product uh, has higher concentration of platelets compared to whole blood, up to 9.3 times concentration. So it does have these uh, growth factors that can induce a healing cascade, TGF beta, PGF, VEGF. And then there's some new data showing that hepatocyte growth factor can also help with modification of the uh, of pain uh, in tendons uh, to help reduce uh, the inflammation in tendons uh, as well. So going to Dr. Pfeffer's uh, presentation on his patient, is PRP an option for this patient? Well, let's look at just what the algorithm might be for a patient coming into your office with Achilles tendinopathy. For me in my practice, I definitely would consider conservative management for at least the first three to six months, which would include rest, NSAIDs, mm -hmm. ice, perhaps nitroglycerin patches, you can consider possible extracorporeal shockwave therapy. I always ask the patient to try some heel lifts in their shoes and possible a boot as well. Therapy is definitely a mainstay of the practice, whether you're doing an injection or in the initial phases of treatment with a focus on the eccentric strengthening program, which has been shown to uh, assist with approximately 80% improvement in uh, patient satisfaction with, uh, with just PT alone. Also, one can consider an AFO brace with a dorsiflexion stop. Now, at this point, you now gone six months, patients still having pain, still having symptoms, and they're not getting better. Well, doc, what can you do to help uh, help me get my pain relief? So the options at this point become, well, we can do surgery. Well, we know surgery in Achilles tendinopathy is kind of a risky area. It's 11 to 19% complication rate in these patients. Uh, but ultimately, approximately 25 to 50% of these patients still may require surgical intervention in the form of an Achilles tendon debridement or with or without a flexor halus as long as transfer. So we do know the results from surgical intervention has achieved moderate success in pain relief, but at the consequence of having the high complication rate. So I think we it's important to offer patients other, op, other, other options. So if no improvement, considering a platelet-rich plasma injection under ultrasound guidance is certainly, I think, a good option here. For me, in my practice, I don't use any lidocaine. And I think that it's important to use under ultrasound guided and use what's called a peppering technique, where you go in and out of the tendon to help increase the uh, vascular channels, uh, to help increase the flow of the PRP to the different tenocytes. It's important to have a, a, a pre-wash and a post-wash of their blood, so to speak, with no NSAIDs one or two weeks before and after. And as Tad brought up, we certainly don't know if uh, what the time of day, the exercise, the diet, uh, uh, and plays a role in terms of when to harvest um, and in terms of the spin, uh, the number of spins on uh, the centrifuge. Also, as I'll point out in a few minutes, we still don't know if it's leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor. For me in my practice right now, I'm using a slightly higher concentrated leukocyte uh, concentration, uh, but not the same that I would use uh, for a patella tendon or a, a tennis elbow. Uh, the post-operative protocol for me is also very important. It's weight bearing is tolerated in a cam walker for at least two weeks and then beginning physical therapy with a functional isometric and eccentric training. Now, before even getting to this point, it's important to lay the crepe and talk to the patient in a very ethical and open manner as to what PRP can and cannot do for the patient for their uh, Achilles tendon pain. And I think that's crucial to the uh, discussion of PRP for our patient care. Um, it's discussing the literature as uh, Tad mentioned and being open and honest about uh, the, dope, the, the alternatives uh, as well as the long-term trials that have been shown to either work or not work. Well, as Tad mentioned, there are certainly a fair number of options or trials out there that haven't shown success with uh, Achilles tendinopathy, but there are some recent studies that have shown some improvement with Achilles uh, tendinopathy uh, related pain with PRP. And one AJSM study with randomized controlled trial, uh, PRP uh, versus a placebo induction with the addition of eccentric loading rehab pro uh, protocol did have a significantly improved pain function activity score as well as reduced tendon thickness at the six month follow up period compared to the placebo group uh, in 2017 study. In, in a rabbit model, uh, we can discuss the idea of uh, leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor. In this model, it had leukocyte rich had a more benefits than repair of tendinopathy uh, to, uh, to discuss that question. Another question that comes up is what does it do on the MRI? Well, a uh, study 2012 in FAI did show that 30 patients had improved uh, AOFA, AOFA, AOFAS score as well as pre-injection versus post-injection MRI and ultrasound studies did show resolution in 27 of the 29 patients at six months. So I think it's certainly important to consider uh, PRP uh, for our Achilles tendinopathy. I also want to touch briefly on 
what is the role for PRP for ankle arthritis? Since this has certainly become a hot topic for patients who are seeing um, some resolution of their pain in the knee. Well, let's talk about what PRP can do in the uh, for the cartilage. We know that's anti-inflammatory by decreasing IL-1 beta and the TNF alpha and mediating the MMPs, in, increasing the production of hyaluronic acid and the HGF that we mentioned earlier. It's chondrogenic, it's chemoattractive, and it's anti-nociceptive. So in a few different studies recently, looking at the efficacy of uh, interarticular injections with PRP for patients with ankle osteoarthritis, there has been some excellent, but yet very and, and very promising data. Uh, in a study on the right, showing uh, in 20 patients, PRP was both safe and effective, and also re uh, resulted in a low adverse event uh, uh, safety profile, and a significant reduction in VAS or pain. Now, this was, there was not a control group in this study, but it definitely did establish that this is a safe thing to use for our patients with ankle arthritis. On the study on the left, a recent study in 2018 in FAI, a study of 27 systemic review of 27 uh, studies did show that there was improved pain relief with the use of hyaluronic acid over saline. However, in the small, tri small trials uh, looking at PRP, it uh, did not show um, uh, any significant uh, improvement beyond just uh, what was mentioned. Now, it's important to note that uh, these are very limited studies, and Dr. Gino Kirchhoffs out of uh, University of Amsterdam has recently started a uh, multicentered randomized controlled double-blinded placebo study uh, looking at PRP for ankle arthritis. I do want to bring up this case that I think is important to discuss. So you have a 60-year-old male tennis pro with several years of ankle pain, and he wants to keep on teaching tennis. He has uh, pain when he teaches, but he doesn't want a fusion. He doesn't want an ankle replacement. So what are his options? And I think that it's important to be able to offer a patient in a very uh, uh, clearly stated approach about the uh, possible benefits uh, that PRP plus or minus hyaluronic acid is a good option for this patient to at least help him continue to teach until he's ready to have surgery and at least give him some perhaps pain relief that may buy him another six months and then maybe perhaps doing this every six months for this patient while again laying the crate that he eventually will need surgery to help address his ankle arthritis. That being said, PRP definitely has promise, as Tad mentioned, but we definitely still need a lot more randomized controlled studies. We need to look at what are the number of injections needed, what type of PRP, leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor, the timing of the injections, what is the post injection protocol. And like this guy on the right here, orthobiologist, I think, is a very highly touted rookie, a lot to prove still. That being said, I appreciate uh, your guys' uh, time and I look forward to a lively discussion. Well, thank you very much. And then we'll um, move to uh, Dr. Frickel. So what what are you looking at? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, great talk, Eric. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we probably meet on uh, mutual ground here, but one one thing I would comment on in your talk is uh, that study that you uh, quoted out of Denmark showing benefit to the PRP above and beyond uh, placebo in that one randomized controlled trial. I think if you look at these studies, um, and this one is it true in that study in particular, sometimes they define the the mean clinically important difference to something that I may not consider clinically different. So there, I think it was a VAS improvement of 25%. So essentially going from a four to a three out of 10. Um, I'm not sure I would qualify that as something um, clinically significant. So I think when you look at some of these studies and there's all kinds of statistics and it's sliced and diced 10 different ways, you really have to sit back and, and say like, okay, do I believe this? Uh, is the criteria that they're using something that I would trust to apply to my patient? So, no, I certainly agree with that uh, that point, Ted. And like you said, I, I think that we definitely meet in the middle here uh, with really the the key take home message being that uh, this is an option for patients looking for pain relief in a non surgical setting. Uh, but really, the most important thing is that first of all. This is not stem cells. We have to be very clear about that. I'm always clear with patients about that. They come in my office, oh, doctor so-and-so did stem cells on me. What do they really do? And so it's, we have to be very clear. This is not stem cells we're doing. We're not, for, especially for ankle arthritis, we're not regrowing any cartilage in your ankle. Um, this is meant to be solely pain relief. And for, for ankle arthritis, buying some time until you get to a surgical uh, 
surgical time you can do the surgery. You have time in your career, time in your life. In regards to the tendinopathy, uh, I think, uh, again, laying the crepe, being upfront honest, like both of us have mentioned, but also understanding that not everybody wants to go through a surgery. There's a lot of risks with surgery. Uh, and um, whether it is placebo or not, I think that there is certainly some some uh, some role to the placebo in this. Patients are getting pain relief. And I think if we can find the best protocol to both extract the PRP and treat them both preoperatively or pre-injection and post-injection with a protocol that can help let the cells marinate in there, allow them to function perhaps and activate uh, in a way that's more promising and giving pain relief, that I think will uh, give patients the opportunity to uh, to get pain relief. Because I think for a lot of these patients, if we don't do PRP on them in a very thoughtful way, they're going to go somewhere else and, and get it. So uh, I would prefer to leave it in our hands. And that's not a reason to do PRP, but it's a reason to, I think, be uh, provide um, a both educated and safe way of doing it for the patients who are looking for a non-surgical uh, treatment. Yeah, right. I think, uh, well, let me just make one comment uh, in addition to that. Uh, I would agree wholeheartedly with the, the stem cell comment. It's a very confusing term, and, and uh, in the research world, we're trying to use terms like connective tissue progenitor cells rather than stem cells, just to be a little more specific with what we're using in orthopedics, at least. But you're right, I think most people in the orthopedic world uh, are not trying to vilify biologics or, or paint them in a negative light. You know, in fact, most of us really want these things to, to uh, we hope that they hold a lot of promise. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to appropriately use these interventions, but we also recognize that we have to evaluate these things in a more rigorous manner and really understand how to best implement them in our patients. So thank you very much, everyone. This is the final episode in our great debate series, but it doesn't mo mean there won't be a sequel next year. So stay tuned, stay safe, take care of the people you love, your patients and yourselves, and thanks for rising to the occasion for all the speakers. Good night. <laughs>